welcome everybody to week nine day two so we're going to continue our exploration of graph theory for this and probably at least one more day so let's take a look at bfs versus dfs so uh if we uh start at some point on here let's say i don't know here yeah um if we do DFS and we, the DFS algorithm is very short, like this will actually navigate through an entire tree, you know, in just four lines. And trees can be fairly complicated, you know, entities. Um, it's basically go left until you hit a dead end, then back up and then go right. Okay, so if we start here, let's say, then for DFS we go left, and then we make a left, and then we make a left turn, and then we make a left turn, and then we make a left turn, and then we make a left turn. Then normally we'd make a left turn here, but we've already been to that one. So this one, uh, the, the key thing that stops you from going in to an infinite loop is that you check to see which nodes you have processed already. And We've already processed that one, so we don't go to the left. Um, in that case, we go to the right. That one's been taken, so we'll go do this one instead. And then we'll make a left turn. Then we'll make a left turn. Then we would normally make a left turn up here, but that one's been processed already. Then we'll make a right turn, but that one's been processed already, so we go to this one instead. Left turn, this one's been taken, so we go to this one instead. Left turn. Left turn's been taken, so we make a right turn. Left turn. Right turn. And there you go. So that is the route that we would take with this being the starting point here. Okay. With BFS, which is more similar to Dijkstra's, uh, it's literally Dijkstra's if all the edges have a weight of one or whatever. Uh, DFS and uh, um, DFS and is its own thing, but BFS is basically dexterous. He's tried to pause the stream. Uh, do you have any questions about this, Tomas? I can, I can, I can pause. <laughs> Which one is dexterous? BFS is dextras when edges all have the same weight right so if all the if all the edges have a weight of one uh, dijkstra's and bfs are literally the same uh okay so for uh, bfs starting in the same place we first go out First go out one from I guess I didn't need to circle that. Whatever. We got one from the start. So if this if you want to think of this in Dijkstra's terms, uh, we have our starting city here, and we add all of the cities that are the shortest distance away from the starting city. If all of the cities have a distance of one, then we add all of these people first. If all the edges, sorry, to be more precise, if imagine this graph, all of these points are one mile away from each other, right? So we're going to be adding uh, children vertices over and over again and sorting it based on their total distance from start. So we start off with just the starting node in here. We have the processed. And we'll call you A. So we start off with A in the process node, and then we add all of A's children to the two process, so I'll call it to do, and we'll add in B, C, and D. And then one at a time, this thing is sorted uh, by total distance from start. And then one at a time, we're gonna pop these people off, B comes off and gets added to the process list. We add its kids to the to-do list, uh, which we will call E and F. 
which are two away, right? Uh, we would try to add A, but A has already been processed, so we skip it. So E and F go on to the to-do list here. We then are done with B. We then process C. C comes up with the process list. We add its kids, but also have a total distance of two. So we're going to add G and H. And then we're done with C. Uh, we then do D. Add D's kids. A's already on there. Uh, yeah, we'll call this one I. And you notice how this this uh, priority queue never changes. Like, there's never been a, a a point in which I've been like, oh shoot, I just found a I just found a faster route. Mm, you can't because when everything's unit distance, just the further you are away, uh, the further you are away, right? If everything is one mile away, if you're two hops from the start, you're two miles away. If you're three hops from the start, you're three miles away. So you actually don't even need to use a priority queue to do. BFS. A regular queue will work. So, yeah. Uh, you might you might not want to use the queue data structure for BFS because you can't search it. And a lot of times you don't want to put a duplicate in here. You could, like you could have, mm -hmm. you can have duplicates and then when they come out, you can check to see if it's been processed already. Like it's not the end of the world, but it's not the most efficient. But yeah, you can just use a regular queue for this because you don't need to keep sorting it based on total distance because two hops is two miles, three hops is three miles. So you just, the order that you process them, you just toss them on the end of the queue and you're good to go. So we'll then process E. E's already added, uh, B's already been processed, so we skip it. Uh, or an I, J, K get added. These guys are now one, two, three away. We then are done with E, we do F. So F is going to add J, K, L, and M. We tried adding G and I. But these guys, uh, we could actually, we, so this is what I'm saying, like we could actually put I and G on here because these guys have not been processed yet. So sometimes depending on your implementation, you'll actually add a duplicate here. And then when they come out the back end, um, you check to see if the thing, like you're at some point you're going to be do do do, and I is going to be up here. And if you pop off I again, you check to see if it's been processed already. And if it has, you skip it. So having duplicates in the to-do list isn't isn't the end of the world. But generally speaking, it's good to use something like a set or priority queue that uh, will eliminate duplicates for you automatically. Now in Dijkstra's, this is the difference. The difference in Dijkstra's is, is that whenever you add something a second time to the to-do list, you have to compare their distances. So if this guy's total distance, the new guy's total distance is 300, and the old guy's total distance is 400, the old guy gets erased, and the new guy remains. And will get sorted based on its total distance to, you know, wherever it should be in the queue. That's the only difference between Dijkstra's and BFS. Is that when you add a duplicate, um, you replace the old one if the new one is a total distance from start smaller than the old one. With BFS, that can't happen. Because you, you process everybody one unit away, then you process everybody two units away. So by the time you're getting to like eight, eight people away, you're not going to find somebody who's like one unit away. Because you've already processed everybody who's one unit away. Because you started with that. So that you don't need to do this step for BFS. Instead, you can just check to see if it's a duplicate and then throw it away. So to get the nearest distance, we are getting the sum and to compare them to each other, figuring out the smallest distance or nearest distance. I don't, I don't know what you mean by the difference between smallest and nearest. Um, for Dijkstra's, um, uh, let me finish this graph here. Uh, uh, G is next. And H, H has no kids. That sort of H, I has no kids. J 
has no kids. That I mean, what I mean by no kids that haven't already been processed, uh, or in the to do list also. Like I said, you can just throw away duplicates. Uh, K then is going to add this one. I done. G done. M. And then we're done. That's all the nodes. So you can see the, the, the graph that you get when you do DFS looks significantly different from BFS, right? So, so with finding the same vertices with a different distance, that means we need some way of tracking the path it took to get there to get that distance. No, you just have a variable that holds the distance. Um, every, no, I'll, I'll go over in a second. Um, So Dijkstra's and BFS are the same if all the edges are just the same weight, right? Um, let's see if I have a picture here. Yeah, okay. So for Dijkstra's, what you do is you start off by um, adding all the kids of A. A is your starting node, right? So we add two, three, and six to the uh, to-do list, right? And we sort it by total distance from start. So we're going to have, at the beginning of the, the thing, we're going to have processed having node one in it and we're gonna have to do having two three and six and you sort this based on the total distance from start not the edge weight the total distance there which in this case is the uh, edge weight so uh it's gonna go two first then three then six so because two has a distance of seven three has a distance of nine and six is the distance of 14. Okay, then the, the loop that we do for doing graph traversal is you pop something off the to-do list, the to process list, you add it to the process list. So we've processed one now, now I'm gonna process two. Okay, and so the difference, here's the difference between BFS and Dijkstra's. It's possible if we have not processed three yet, it's possible we found a new route that's closer. Like if this distance here is one, do you see how this would be a faster distance? This would only be eight to get here, right? We don't know until, and once you've processed something, you know you've got a shortest path to it. But until then, there's always the possibility that a, there's a, a, a different path that will get you to a, a new node quicker. And so for every child, child of two, if it's been processed, you skip it. If it hasn't been processed, what you do is you add up your distance, which is seven, plus the distance here of, let's say, one, and you get eight. And you check to see if the distance this way, the new three with the distance of eight, you check to see if that's shorter than the one already in the data structure. If it is, the old one comes out and the new one comes in. And then you do the same for four over here. Uh, so then four is 15 away total. And now that three is the shortest distance out of the remaining things to be processed, we're gonna process three. And so three's distance is eight, using my example. And so eight plus two is 10. That's shorter than the old six. So the old six comes out, a new six comes in with a, with a 10. Uh, two's already been processed, we skip. One's already been processed, we skip. 4 goes in, uh, 4 is already in there with a distance of 15. Uh, the new distance this way is 19, so the new distance is not used. Do you see that? So for every node, and for your assignment, it's every tile on the, on the map, you track your total distance from start. So I'm not just writing this number here on the screen. That's in code. So this vertex is going to have an integer holding its total distance from start. And so to figure out the new total distance from start for this, these other routes, you take this distance and you add the edge weight to it. And so that would be a distance of 10. Distance of 10 is less than the distance of 14. So we erase that and put it in with 10. This one, eight plus 11 is 19. That's bigger than uh, what I had before, which was, uh, should I know what we had before was uh, not 15, sorry, it's 22. So the uh, 
the new route would be 19. If you go this way, it'll be 19. Whereas if you go this way, it'll be 22. And so 19 is lower than 22. So the old four comes out and the new four goes in with a distance of 19. And then of the two remaining nodes, we've got six with a distance of 10. And we've got uh, four with a distance of 19. So we do six. So six comes off. We add in five here with a distance of 10 plus nine, it's 19. And now we have a tie between five and four, so it doesn't matter which one comes off first. Uh, but they've got no more kids to add anyway, so they're both going to pop off, and we're, we'll be done. So the total distance would be 19 to 5, 19 to 4, 8 to 3, 10 to 6, 7 to 2, and 0 to 1. And you always write down where you came from. So if you pull up your Google Maps, and you're like, uh, yo, what's the fastest route to 5? five nodes that got there from six. And so what you do is you traverse it backwards and you end up getting five, six, three, two, one. And then you just reverse the, the vector or whatever. And it's gonna tell you, okay, so start at one, then go to two, go to three, go to six, go to five. And that's your, that's your GPS route. Any, any more questions on this? Yeah, so, yeah, so every node is going to have um, just one um, edge, I guess, which is where it came from, which who its parent is in the in the in the tree. So you don't have to maintain the entire route for every for every graph. All you have to all you have to know is who your parent is, and then when they pull up the GPS app and they're like, "All right, I want to navigate to three, then you go to the data structure, you find three, and three says, "Oh, I uh, my parent is two. and so it, it, the GPS route will backtrack. It'll do three to two to one. And then it'll output in reverse order. So we'll say, okay, to get to three, first travel to Detroit, then make a left and go to Ann Arbor or something like that. It's a sorted version of graph traversal. Yeah, that's exactly right. So it's BFS. It's BFS, but the to-do list is sorted by total distance from start. So for each one of those vertices, it has a distance from start in it, a uh, variable. And that's what the min heap uses to sort the thing. Yes, each node, each node stores the total distance from start. Yeah, you have to. A lot of students will screw up like I did because I haven't had enough coffee yet and use the edge weight instead of the total distance, right? So what I wrote down for four was it was 15 away. That's wrong. It's not 15 away from start. It's 22 away, right? 22 away from start. So. And so to go to each location, we get a new location. We add, yeah, you take the distance that uh, the current, the, the node that you're processing currently, like if we're processing two, then when we add three, we take our distance, which is seven, and add 10 to it and get 17. Now, in the example graph here, 17 is greater than what we had in there already. What we had in there already was we had a route from one to three with a distance of nine. And so that one doesn't do anything, right? So when we start off, three has a distance of nine. And then when we process two, we check this and we discard that route. This one's a new one, so we add that one. And then we're going to process three. We find that um, nine plus 11 is 20. This route is lower than this route. This way was 22. This way was 20. 
It's only going to use the pass you've processed. Yeah. When, when, when you're in the to-do list, there's always a possibility you're going to find a faster route. You know, the first time we add four, it has a distance of 22. But later on, we find a route that's faster. That's this way. Right? This, this total route here is 20. This total route here is 22. Okay? So, uh, we, the first route that we found had a distance of 22, but then we found a better one. And so as long as something is still in the to-do list, the to-process list, the frontier or whatever it's called, um, there's always a possibility you'll come across a better route. But once it's been processed, you can't. Because we're always pulling... The, the way that the proof of Dijkstra's works is that um, we're always adding to our graph, the, the new tree, the solution. We're adding to it the city that is the smallest total distance away at all times, of all the nodes we know about. And so we can't ever find a faster route than, than that one, because if we did, we would have added it already. So that's that's basically the proof of dextrose. Uh, I think in the process list, the nodes already have the lowest distance. No, because um, when we start off, this, we're, we're gonna have four, Oh, in the process. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, in the process list, every, everything's been solved. You just discard if you, if you ever come across it again. Like when you're processing four, you're going to try adding three, you're going to try adding two. Just skip them. Because you, they've already been processed. If they've been processed, they have the smallest provable distance from start. So, uh, one to two to four to five would be uh, one to two to four to five would have a distance of 26. Not 28. Because uh, we're not going to process four until it's the shortest distance from start. So even though our first route here is a distance of 22, so on our to-do list, when we start off, we added four with a distance of 22. But then later on when we processed three, we found a better route, so this guy just gets deleted. There's no reason to keep it around ever. And then we, well, I shouldn't say that, but yeah. Um, what if there's a traffic accident or something? But um, but basically the, the old one comes off and the new one comes in. And so by the time we process four, we get around to processing it, we know that its distance is, is 20 and so the distance to five would be 26. Because four is 20 away. And then, so five would be 26 away. When picking the next tell to move to you, are we sticking with the three options from Greedy? No. <laughs> This is not the same assignment as before. So the CSI 40 version of this, there's three possibilities, moving east, moving northeast, moving southeast. For this assignment, you can travel in any direction. And so you're gonna be dike string up a storm. Every point on the map for the um, Bridges Mountain assignment, every point on the map, every grid point, every tile is a vertex. And they have Eight connections. Every tile has eight edges. North, south, east, west, northwest, northeast, southwest, southeast. So you are going to have a really, really large graph to process. It's a lot of vertices. There's a lot of edges. So I've had some students have their Dijkstra assignment take like two days to complete and things like that. And if if you do that, I'm, I'm going to kill your process because it, it shouldn't take that long. It, 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 there should be a, a noticeable pause when it's like processing California, but like it shouldn't take like more than a little bit of time. So we're using Dijkstra's to find every little bit of possibility to find the nearest distance of the graph. Um, sort of, but you don't have to. It, it's an exponential problem. Like if you just tried brute forcing it, 
and you tried every single possible route from uh, Fresno to San Diego. You know, I could, you know, take a step left, two steps left, one step north, one step east, one step south. It's it's unsolvable, right? Because there's technically an infinite number of possible routes. I could run in a circle five times. I could run in a circle 20 times. I can run in a circle a million times. There's there's no there's no limit. And if you're going to put a rule in to avoid backtracking, then it merely becomes an exponential problem. Um, where, you know, it's like two to the number of possible spots in America, which is a very large number. Um, so what we do with Dijkstra is, is we manage that complexity by keeping track of um, these things that are turned red here. These are ones that we have solved and we know we have the shortest distance for. This is what I call the processed list. The nodes that are on the process list, see this distance here? That's guaranteed that's the shortest distance. And then the to-do list, the to-process list, is in flux. And you can find new routes that are better than the one that you have before. And if you ever find a new route to a node that is better than the one you have before, you throw the old one away, you put the new one in. So you can use a set for this if you want and program your set to sort by distance, smallest to greatest, or a prior queue, priority queue, C++ does the same thing. Um, set might be better if you want to actively look in the set to see what's there already and throw away duplicates. Priority queue works fine if you're just going to toss all the duplicates in and then as like you know what I mean by duplicates? Like, uh, we're going to have a 4 in here with a distance of 22. And we're also going to add in a 4 with a distance of 20, which is this route here. Uh, heaps, you can't, you, you can't search a heap. So looking for a duplicate in a heap, you can't do it. Uh, I used a heap, I think, for the assignment. And so what I did was I just, uh, if I ever got a second person coming out, so at some point we're going to process four and add them to the, the process list. It'll have a four on it. And then if I ever get a duplicate, I check to see if it's if it's been processed already. And if it has, I just throw it away. If you don't want duplicates to be in your, your um, to-do list, then you can use a set and you can do a, a find or a count and see if it's in there already. And if it is, throw it away. And that might be better depending on how many duplicates you get. I'd, I'd have to actually benchmark it and see which one would be faster. Okay. So. Yeah, and so Dijkstra's are used in a lot of algorithms. Shortest paths comes up all the time in computer science, as I'm sure you can imagine. Um, so like if you're doing networking with routers and stuff like that. I mean, Dijkstra's is a pretty basic algorithm and there's lots of kind of better ones, but you know, a lot of people just say, well, you use Dijkstra's for that. Um, circuit routing, like if you're laying out things on a printed circuit board, um, if you have routers, GPS, you know, all that kind of stuff. So uh, routing Creole, routing gumbo, routing barbecue, routing remoulade. Routing pasta, routing saute, routing kebabs. It's a lot of routing. Okay. So I'm going to move on to a new algorithm. So do you have any questions about Dijkstra's? You want to see another example of it? Or do you, do you feel pretty good with this? You'd like to see another example? Okay. Um,
the code is hard to wrap your mind around. Yeah, that's fair. So uh, maybe I'll give you a hint with that too. So, where's my pen? Where's my pen? This thing turn off. There you go, the old turn it off and turn it back on again worked. Okay. So let's do a graph here. And th this one I'm going to make similar to your, your current homework assignment. Because this is how the tiles are laid out, right? So every tile is connected to the eight neighbors around it. And then I'll just throw some numbers on here. 10, 20, 10, 70, 5, 10, 10, 20, 30. Okay, so let's start with A. So A is going to be the starting node. And when you do Dijkstra's, you're actually going to compute the shortest note, shortest uh, route, rather, from A to every node, from A to every vertex on the graph. And you can actually save this. Like, as long as the road network doesn't, as long as the road network doesn't change, you can actually just write down the results of Dijkstra's, and the next time somebody needs to navigate from that point, well, you've already solved it. And so companies like Google will actually pre-compute the solution and save it in their data centers for like America, <laughs> you know, and they don't do this quite exactly, but, um, yeah, they, they actually have data centers that will, you know, every time the road network updates, they will sit there and run for a week and essentially pre-compute shortest routes to, you know, every place in America from every place in America. And then when you do routing, um, they can just pull it up off disk. What is the end node? Uh, F, I guess. F will be the end here. Okay. So these are all tiles, and they're going to have like a row and a column number. You know. Will the shortest path be A, C, F? Probably, but we don't know this yet. We have to do Dijkstra's. So when we start off, uh, we're going to add A to the uh, to-do list. So we start off with the process list and the to-do list and A is in the to-do list. This is the starting state of our program, okay? Then, uh, repeatedly, until the to-do list is empty, we will repeatedly pop the uh, front of the, the top of the to-do list off. That's the person with the smallest total distance. In this case, A was on there with a distance of zero, right? And it's, in, and it's the only one, so it pops off and gets added to the uh, process list. Then you add all of the kids of A, and they're gonna be sorted by total distance from start. So we're gonna have C with a distance of 10, we're gonna have D with a distance of 20, and B with a distance of 20, and I'm gonna resolve ties alphabetically, just because it, why not? Okay, so after we finish processing A, um, then this is the state of the graph. Okay, or the state of our algorithm. Isn't D70? I can't read my own handwriting, dude. I don't know. <laughs> sure, let's make it 70. Uh, 70. 70, yes. Okay. So, uh, there. So, CBD, oil, I don't know. Okay. So, then we repeat. We, we keep doing the same thing. We pop the first thing off the to-do list. We add all the children. That aren't that haven't been processed already. That's the algorithm. It's the same algorithm for Facebook. It's just there's the just the to do list is going to be sorted by total distance. That's the only difference. So we're going to pop off C, add it to the process list, and then we're going to add all of C's children. And when we do this, 
we're going to get some duplicates, right? So uh, B is already on the list. And so what you can do is you can either just insert the duplicate. Uh, do I have a route distance here? I don't. Uh, all right, I'll make that one five. I think I forgot to do that. Or, hmm, no, nah, I'll make it 15. Okay. So you can either use a set, and if, if you're using a set to do this, then you can query the data, the, the data structure and say, hey, is B in there already? And your code's like, yeah, it's in there already. Okay, what's its distance? 20. Okay, I found it. I got a new B coming in here. The new B has a distance of 10, because our distance is 10, right? 10 plus 15, 25. Okay, the one in there already is shorter than the new one. The new one's coming in with 25. Two men into one man leave. In this case, the one that's further away leaves. If you're using a heap instead, if you use a heap to implement this, or a priority queue, uh, which is how I did it, then what happens is that B just gets insert the new B gets inserted in there. So so what happens is the new B new B gets inserted in there as well. So it would you would have a B with a distance of twenty and a B with a distance of twenty five, and that's fine because what happens is that uh, once something gets added to the process list, if you ever get a duplicate, you check to see if it's already been processed. If it is, you just throw it away. So it just it just depends on your underlying data structure as to which one's best. So you can either use a heap or a set to do this. Um, okay, but either way, um, we have found that this is still the best. And then we need to process the rest of C's children. So we're going to add an E with a distance of 20. Okay. And we're going to add an F with a distance of 20. Maybe I should have picked different weights. A lot of ties here. Um, and D with a distance of 15. So we found a faster D than the old one. The old D had a distance of 70. The new D has a distance of 15. So the old D comes out, the new D comes in, and then we sort the data structure by total distance from start. So you move to the front of the queue. Let's see here. So this data structure always has to be sorted least to greatest. Do you see that? So before D was at the end, it was 70, but now that we found a, a faster route for D, the old one got deleted and the new one got inserted and it sorts right up to the top. So the next one we're gonna process is D. So D is gonna come off, get added to the process list. Um, then we add D's children. So D is done now with a distance of 15. And so we have a route this way that's 25. Do you see that? Distance is 10. D is 15 away. 15 plus 10 is 25. 25 is greater than the one we have in here already, so we ignore it. Uh, 15 plus 30 is 45. 45 is greater than the one we have in here already. We ignore it. Uh, what do we have here? Um, 15 plus 10 is 25. That's greater than this one, so we ignore it. We're done. Next up, B. So B is going to come off added to the process list. And so B's uh, official distance is 20. We add B's children. All three of B's children are already processed, so we skip each each of them. So nothing, nothing more happens. We then process E. E's got a route. Uh, so E is 20 away officially now. When you move it to the process list, that's when its distance becomes finalized. So E's 20 way. Uh, so we try adding C. C's already been processed. We try adding D. D's already been processed. So we try adding F. F would be this way 20 plus 20 is 40. Uh, the one we have in there already is faster. So we discard and we're done with E. Then finally we do F. 
and f is going to come in with a distance of 20 and we're done. So now the to-do list is empty. We have successfully completed Dijkstra's and we've got um, distances to every tile on this graph and uh, remember when you come uh, when you add somebody to the when you add somebody to the to-do list you also write down where you came from. You write down the x and y location of the tile that you came from. And there you go. Okay. Look at it on the server. So all this stuff is going to take place in Find Path. Find Path is the Dijkstra's algorithm. And right now what you have is source code that is doing the old CSI 40 implementation of it. Okay. Uh, don't give this source code to the CSI 40 people because the CSI 40 people are actually doing the same assignment that you guys are. They're just doing the easier one. And so the CSI 40 people are going to be um, just looking at three neighbors. Uh, you, you don't have the luxury of doing this algorithm. You're going to have to pull this whole algorithm out and put Dijkstra's in instead. Yeah, you've literally got the solution to the CSI 40 people in here. Can you show them the code for this assignment so you can watch your ears bleed? Uh, don't give them this code. You can show them your code, I guess, but it might just confuse them because it's, it's a different assignment, right? It's not the same algorithm you're asked to, to do. So, um, yeah, also if a CSI 40 student turns this in, which happened last year, uh, uh, Somebody in 26 gave the source code to the 40 people because the ending point of 40 is the beginning point of 26. So they passed the code back and it, it, the cheat checker immediately picked it up. I mean, yeah. no CSI 40 student writes code this way anyway. So. Yes, yeah, so you start working, you start with the working CSI 40 solution. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't matter because it's not, it's, this doesn't help you at all, right? This doesn't help you at all. Uh, it, it, it's only in there so you can see how to access a, a 1D array as if it was a 2D array. Do you guys remember how to do that? Because this is a pointer, right? And a pointer is an array. And an array is a pointer with one small caveat. So this is... Uh, very common in the high-performance computing world where you pass a pointer to a chunk of data. And you have to pass in the dimensions of the data separately. Uh, you said a pointer was an array, so it can actually, yeah. So you can actually have made this, this, and it'll compile the same way. And is it a 1D array or is it a 2D array? It's it's just a... All a pointer is is a memory address. It's a memory address. Is it pointing to one integer or a million integers? You don't know. It's just a memory address. And so a pointer is the... A, an int pointer is the pointer to the address of a int variable. That's it. You don't know how many there are. It could just be a variable. Could could be a array. You don't know. And that's why whenever you work with these sorts of things, um, you need to pass in, you need to track, you need to pass in the dimensionality of the data separately and hope you don't screw that up. With a vector, you can always query the vector and be like, dot size, how big are you? And the vector will tell you. With pointers, you got to do that yourself. And you've got your memory address where it starts, and you got the size, in this case, <clears throat> it's two variables, width and height, separately. And you just kind of have to hope they travel together correctly. So uh, I would personally, if I was in your shoes, refactor this code to uh, make that a, a vector of vectors instead. It's less performant. Vector of vectors have worse cache locality. And you can have a problem if you use pushback or popback where it's no longer rectangular, right? Because every row is a vector. And so if you screw up, 
and do pushback on this assignment, then you can have a rectangle that's not a rectangle. So. It's a fun assignment. All right, so. Um, yeah, I and mean, personally, I would, like the way I solved it, I just I just replaced it with the vector vectors. But the um, this is call by reference C style. This is a C style call by reference, so it's call by pointer. And so this is very common in C world, where you call a function passing a reference to a variable. So what Bernie Struthrup did when he made call by reference was he made it so instead of doing that, you just pass the regular variable in, and then instead of passing in by pointer, you pass a reference like that. And then rather than needing to do this, you just do that. So behind the scenes, call by reference and call by pointer are exactly the same thing, as far as I know. So if you actually look at what's getting passed in here, this is just gonna pass in a pointer to width. If you look at this, it's gonna pass in a pointer to height. Same thing. It's just, it just depends on whether you want to write code that looks like this, width is equal to W, or if you want to write code that looks like this. Dereference the pointer height and set that variable equal to H. So, exact same code it went behind the scenes. But that was something that C++ did because pointers are scary, and so width works just like a regular variable. Uh, there's, there's one difference, which is that it can't be null. And that's, that's actually something that matters here. Do you guys see this? Whenever you pass something by reference, it must exist. Uh, unless you use something really terrible, this variable must exist when you pass something to read data, right? So up here in read data, width must exist. Height, you could pass in null pointer, right? Pointers can be nullable. Pointers might not be pointing at anything at all. So do you see a possible bug in this read data code? What's the first thing you guys should check for when you pass a pointer? Looking at this, now I, I know it's not gonna be null because I've seen the code up above, but yeah. Uh, check to see if height is null, check to see if max val is null. You don't need to do that check if you pass it in by reference, right? When you pass something by reference, it can't be null. There's not even a way of, there's not even a way of checking to see if it's null. And that's, that's actually a really important difference. But um, behind the scenes, this bit here and this bit here, this bit here and this bit here, it's all going to compile down to the same assembly. But semantically, a pointer could be null. And so if I was writing this code call a pointer, I would check to see if height is null first. And in fact, if I was writing code this way, I would write code like this to indicate, in fact, in C++, the, the, the style of this whole thing here is C. This is a C style program, not a C++ style program. But uh, if I was writing this in C++, that thing I have highlighted there, I would do it that way to indicate that height might not exist. So it's it's effectively the same thing as call by reference, but what I'm indicating to my readers, you guys, or whoever it is that's consuming my code, I'm indicating that height might be null. We might not have a height at all. And that's not the case for this program. So I would probably refactor this does that, make sense? Does that make sense to you? Like, I would refactor this to that. Because height can't be null. So it is more correct to use call by reference, because references can't be null, unless you do something really horrible. Do okay. you guys see the difference? Behind the scenes, like, the, the assembly doesn't care. The assembly is going to be the same no matter what. But, you know... What if max val is null? Like, you know, we're writing to it, you know what I mean? Like we're actually writing the maximum value down without checking to see if it's a null pointer, you know what I mean? Like, right? So 
I, I would refactor all these to be call by reference. In fact, I think that's what I did. Like that. And rather than returning an it pointer, which is done via uh, new here. Yeah, pull that pointer out there. Uh, max it all be here. So, um, so rather than doing call by pointer, I use call by reference. And then rather than returning an int pointer, which is just a memory address, which is the, the result of this new, uh, the WRK is my initials, by the way. So I added in this check because it was doing an allocation without checking to see if the pointer that came out was, was valid. So this is getting an int pointer, and that pointer is going to point to width times height uh, ints. Okay. So when we're going to read from the file, the first two things we read are the width and the height of the data. We then allocate memory enough to hold that data, and then we loop across size, which is width times height, uh, integers, reading them in, and stuffing them into the uh, array. Okay. And that's how you read from disk, and then at the end of the day, it returns the pointer, and the width, and the height, and the max val all get returned also, because those were called by pointer variables. And there you go. So this is a perfectly acceptable read data function. All right. So if you wanted to switch this out to be a vector of vectors rather than L of data looking like that, I would say vector of vector of ints named L of data. The return type would have to change. And it's going to be initialized to be height rows. And each row is going to be a vector of integers of size width. So this makes a 2D vector, rectangular vector, of height, rows, and width columns. Okay. And then I don't need to check, well, I mean, I guess I could, but I don't need to. And then this here, I would switch out like this for every For every row, row is less than height, row plus plus. So for every row, turn this into a 2D thing, right? For every column, so rather than using a 1D array, I'm using a 2D vector. So we need a 2D vector is require um, Uh, 2D, I learned that from Hazleton, by the way. So, do you see what I did? I was, I'm inside of a, uh, a block and I need to update it. What I did before is I'd come up here and just be like right into nine lines or something like that, and I did one too many, All right? So, right into eight lines or something like that. Or before I come up here and say equal sign shift five and do it. But just while you're inside of it like this, you can say equal, which is the reformat command, I for enter and then a uh, close bracket, and then it reformats everything within the brackets, within, which is nice. Okay, so uh, if we're doing a 2D uh, vector, we need to have a doubly nested for loop. So for every row, for every column, we're gonna read in a value here, and uh, if the value we read in is bigger than the biggest we've seen, the biggest we've seen is now that value, and then rather than using this, like we would do in SeaWorld, we are going to say elev, elev data dot at row dot at column is equal to val. Okay. And then we return elev data. 
So do you, do you see how the refactoring process works? I haven't compiled it and tested it yet, but um, that's sort of what what you do. And it, if I was doing this for realsies, the first thing I would have done is replace these guys call by pointer to call by reference, save, test, compile, da 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 da. And then I would replace this with the vector events and do what I just did right here, where it's reading in this way instead of this way. And then up top and up top over here, rather than being a pointer elevation data. Um, this would be like a vector vector fence. Okay. Oh, you're going to be called. Yeah, these guys are all called by value now, or called by reference now. Let's see, what are you upset about? No matching function call. Uh, with hype max valve. Those are all ints. Uh, int, int, int. I don't want to save this because I want. Yeah, I know that one doesn't work. Uh, what are you complaining about? Oh, that's that's the approach. I'm, I'll just stop. I'll just stop there. So uh, let's go ahead and take a break. It's already 11. Let's come back at 11.15. And if you have any more questions about the assignment, let me know. This will give you good experience refactoring C code to be more C++-like. And it will teach you Dijkstra's. So it's a good assignment. So have any questions ready because I'm, I'm going to be moving on. And I'm going to be camping this weekend. So if you want any questions answered this weekend, I'm not going to be here. I'm going to be gone. So um, think of any questions you have real fast. Okay, so let's come back. Uh, let's come back at 1120 at this point. Okay, let's see. And we're back. All right. <clears throat> you guys have any more questions about Dijkstra's or you think you got this? Got it theoretically. Okay. Yeah, you're gonna be. This is the thing that's gonna be going into the data structures. This tile class here. You're gonna make a <clears throat> hash table to see if it's been seen already, and the hashing function hashes it based on its x and y location. So it'll be able to determine very quickly if, given an x and y location, if it's been processed before. So it'll be a very fast operation to check to see if something has been processed. And um, the less an operator and double equals operator allows this to work with heaps, sets, and hash tables. So this tile class should be done for you. Arguably, nah, I guess you do need this. Yeah, it's basically done for you. Okay, just need to be able to code it. Yep, that's always the thing. I wonder if there's it's the biggest map we have. So I think Tahoe's the smallest of the of the regular maps. You might want to uh, do, do do your testing on Tahoe. Hmm or make your own map. And the format for the map is the width and the height, and then just row after row of data. So just make your own test data, start with all zeros, see if you can navigate across a flat plains, you know? And then make a huge mountain range with one gap in it, and see if you can, see if your thing will find the path between, uh, you know, the mountains and things like that. So you need to learn, you need to learn, you need to get into the habit of testing your own code 
if something doesn't work, don't, don't just be like, I give up. You know, the, the, the single most important skill in computer science is just to keep trying and not like trying dumb things, but like try to systematically figure out with laser precision where my code went wrong. You know, because when I coded this myself, it didn't work right the first time. Um, the uh, thing had a tendency to go like this. And uh, I think I had an out of bounds check or something like that that also that also failed. And so you just need, you know, it, when it quits, it's like, you know, out of bounds, you know, dot at operator, blah, 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 blah. It just quits. So then you need to figure out what the hell went wrong. You know, and you need to figure this, you need to be able to, it's a skill, right? You've got all this code and one line in your code is wrong. Greater than equal. One <laughs> line is wrong. You know, there's probably more than one wrong line. But um, what you're trying to do is, is just zoom in and find that line as quickly as possible. That's a skill. It's a real skill. You got your code, it's running, it crashes. Why? Where? Yeah. And then one of the big parts is not just staring at your code. One of the big parts is making data that you can feed to it to cause it to crash. Creating test maps. Seeing what happens if you have negative values on the map. See what happens if everything's a mountain. You know, does it behave the same way on a plains? It's all at elevation zero or at elevation 1000, because if it behaves differently, your code's wrong, <laughs> right? Because if you're just using the elevation as the penalty, that's wrong, right? It's the difference in elevation. If you're up at on a high plateau, there's no penalty for driving on a flat plateau at high elevation. But I've seen a lot of students just add in a penalty for being high. And then they'll, they'll, their routing will try to get them off the plateau as quickly as possible, which is wrong. If the start and the ending point are on a plateau, it should just drive across the plateau to the ending point. But their code would like go off the plateau, down, drive along the, the, the flat area next to the plateau, then go back up, which is wrong. It's a wrong solution. And so by creating sample maps and feeding in different data, that also gives you an insight into what your code is doing wrong. And one of, one of the best skills you can develop over the years is the ability to very, very quickly find out why your code's wrong. Because most of the time you spend on these assignments isn't actually doing the coding. It's trying to figure out why the hell what you coded doesn't work. <laughs> and so if you can develop that skill and develop it so that you can quickly find out why your code's wrong, you're going to go from beating you're going to go from beating the, uh, here, I'll, I'll lower the quality on the stream. I'm at max, I'm at max, uh, quality right now. Uh, let's see here. Um, you're going to go from like beating your head against the table for eight hours down to like a couple minutes of frustration. You're like, okay, there's the problem. Oh, so I'd like for y'all to get into that habit, make test data, test your code yourself, you know? You, you are a little bit spoiled because I create test cases for you, you know? It's like when you type input tester, it tests your code for you. And in real life, you got to make the test cases yourself. And I think this would be a good one. Make different maps, things like that. Do you guys all understand the file format? Like it's, yeah, width, height, and then just row after row of elevation data. That's it. See out debugging. Mm -hmm. Learning how to make your own test cases is hard. Yeah, it's a skill. It's a, it's, a, it's a good skill. Think about all the different things that can go wrong. What if you start in the top left corner of the map? There's a whole bunch of points that you can't go to. You can't go north. You can't go west. You can't consider those. Uh, if you go out of bounds when you start on the top left corner, your code's wrong. Try starting the top left, top right, bottom left, bottom right. Make sure you're checking all of those edge conditions. Top edge, left edge, bottom edge, right edge. What if the starting node and the ending node are the same space? Is your code going to detect that? There's a lot, you know, 
does your code handle negative elevations? There's a lot of ways code can go wrong and you need to learn to get into the habit of testing them, how to identify the edge conditions, write tests for them, and become confident that your code is working correctly. Okay. So, um, that's it for Dijkstra's. Uh, it requires you to know a lot about your program. Yeah, it does. And uh, part of this program you're not, you haven't written, so you need to stare at the code and understand what it's doing first before you uh, can really do anything else. And it's C, it's C style programming. Um, the good news is the find path algorithm can basically be, you can rip its guts out. It, it's wrong, right? So the, uh, the, the find path algorithm you have right now goes from the left edge of the map to the right edge of the map. That's not the assignment. So you pull out pretty much everything on the middle. Okay, so next big algorithm, minimal spanning trees. Uh, the Bridges people just sent me an um, email the other day. They just wrote uh, a minimal spanning tree implementation in Bridges. And they, whenever my email loads, uh, wow, a lot of emails today. <sighs> Here we are. So this is in bridges. And what they did was they created a minimal spanning tree. Okay. And these are all of the cities in North Carolina, I think. Yeah. And they're not laid out geographically because remember a graph, where you draw the vertices doesn't matter. And so bridges will just put the vertices wherever. And what a minimal spanning tree is, is given all the cities in North Carolina, and you got distances between them, which aren't drawn on here, but they're there. <clears throat> all these lines are all of the different routes in North Carolina between the different cities. So you can drive from this city to this city, and this city to this city, this city to this city. And the question is, for minimal spanning tree, how can I hook up all of these cities with the least amount of concrete? With the least amount of roads. Okay. So normal road networks look like this, right? Like there's a lot of different connections and things like that. The minimal spanning tree is about the minimal amount of roads you need to build so that all of the cities in, in this case, North Carolina, are all hooked up to the road network. That makes sense. So for example, in California, we could have a highway running from San Diego to LA, which there is, it's called the I-5. Uh, highway running from LA to San Francisco, which there is. It's also called the I-5. We can have a freeway going from LA to Bakersfield. It's also the I-5 for most of it, but it splits off to the 99. Um, and then a freeway from Bakersfield to Fresno, which is the 99, and Fresno to Sacktown, which is also the 99. So minimal spanning tree for California would be basically the I-5 and the, and the 99. You know, and that's all of the major towns in California. No offense to people from Davis or <laughs> Tahoe or whatever. I five beautiful north of the bay. Yeah, but there's no cities north of the bay, so. <laughs> San, what about San Jose? <laughs> it's part of Sacra. It's part of San Francisco. Um, drive to Portland. Yeah, yeah. Northern California is beautiful. Northern Cal, and it's like half the state. And like no, nobody goes there or pays attention to it. Okay. So, yes, yeah, so the I-5 actually kind of goes past San Francisco. You have to kind of hook a left on the 80 at some point. So, probably add that in there. Does that, does that make sense to you? Because we, we could have designed the road network a lot worse, right? We could have built a giant bridge from, like, San Diego to Fresno and San Diego to Bakersfield. And those are two separate bridges. You know what I mean? Do you understand how wasteful that is to, to have, like, a bridge or a tunnel running direct from San Diego to Fresno. I've thought about this before. I've actually thought it'd be really neat 
so I don't have to drive through LA, just build a giant bridge over LA, you know, and just like people who, and there's no off ramps, right? There's maybe some emergency services. You might have some truck stops like up there in the sky where you can like, stop and get gas and, and like they'll tow your car if it breaks down on the bridge. Like basically just like a big, like eight lane wide bridge. just go like going over like LA, you know, so that people that don't want to deal with LA just don't have to deal with LA. Like you're going from San Diego to San Francisco, you just take the bridge over, you know what I mean? Or maybe you just build a, a freeway out in the ocean, you know? So you, you're there in Camp Pendleton, you make a left, you go across the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> that would disregard physics. Uh, it would be expensive too, but worth it in my opinion. Because uh, LA's kind of garbage. You know, so basically like right around, uh, I don't know, right around here, you know, you just you build a bridge and the bridge just kind of, maybe it goes to Catalina, that'd be nice. And then... That it kind of like comes up here or something. You can just like drive around LA and just like not deal with it. And then you just bulldoze the mountains apart and then you like kind of come around. Now you need to come around a little bit, a little bit west of there because that's still kind of horrible. Yeah, like maybe coming to Simi Valley, just like a big eight lane bridge just going this way and then right through the mountains, take the mountains out and then just kind of connect up around here somewhere. I think that'd be a good waste of taxpayer money or a tunnel. Just goes all the way underneath LA, something like that. Or go by a plane, or build a bullet train. Yeah, either way. Either way will work for me. So, Hyperloop Tunnel, yeah. Just a giant tunnel. But, I mean, think about how, how wasteful that would be, right? Like, if you built a tunnel that connected San Diego to Bakersfield, right? And then you built a separate tunnel, not the same tunnel, a separate tunnel from San Diego to Fresno, right? That would be... A shortest path right like if you're trying to make the shortest possible path between Fresno and San Diego you build a bridge or you build a tunnel that just draws a straight line bloop just there well if you're trying to minimize travel time from San Diego to Fresno and San Diego to Bakersfield you just build a bridge you build a straight road this goes you know right across the ocean right to Bakersfield you know what I mean and then you have one that goes to Irvine, one to LA. It looks like this. You know, you just have a, a a road going out from San Diego. There's a there's a bridge and a tunnel that goes all the way up to San Francisco. Like just, you know, just like that. But think about how expensive that would be, and how wasteful. All right. <laughs> right. Because to me, it seems like it'd be a lot more efficient to build a tunnel from Bakersfield to San Diego, and then a separate tunnel from Bakersfield to Fresno. You know what I mean? Like, do you guys agree that would make more sense? Like, you hook up San Diego to Bakersfield and Bakersfield to Fresno, rather than two separate tunnels. You know what I mean? Two separate tunnels would be faster, but the cost would be enormous. That's interesting. Channel Islands of California. That's a cool... That's interesting. I did that. It only appears at like certain zooms. Huh. Weird. Huh. Only at two zoom levels does it appear. Okay. So a minimal spanning tree is sort of like the minimal amount of roads that you need or the minimal amount of tunnels or bridges, whatever. A minimal spanning tree is the minimal amount of road building you have to do to connect up all the cities in California or North Carolina. All right. So plumbers do this. Uh, has anyone here worked in construction before? <clears throat> McCohen? you have as okay so when you do plumbing in a house what's 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 something that you can um tell me about house how houses are plumbed in terms of like what rooms they run plumbing to think about your house right now or your apartment Notice anything weird about the plumbing in the house? Yeah. 
It's, is it shortest paths or is it minimal spanning tree? That's a, that's actually a good question. So in my house, uh, the water comes up right on the back side of this wall right here. That's where it comes up. That's the service pipe that comes up out of the ground. Okay. That's where the city's water comes in. Then it needs to deliver water to different parts of my house. Got a kitchen, right? Got a sink, all right? And then I've got a fridge. The fridge has a water tap on it. Okay. Um, showers, toilets, sinks. In the garage, there's a, a sink in the garage as well. I don't know why, but there is one. Water heater. Yeah. So uh, the water heater, by the way, both takes water in and gives water back out. So all the water in the house has to kind of be connected to the water heater as well. right? So you got the cold water coming in. You got the water heater coming in, uh, pr providing hot water. And you got a hot water line and a cold water line that kind of distributes water through the house. So... What do they optimize for? What do they optimize for when they're when they're laying out the plumbing in a house? What do they optimize the house for? The layout of the house. Has anyone here ever done architecture? Drafting? Anything like that? Laundry. Oh yeah, the laundry room also. Yeah, it's good. So you have all these needs. You know, you need to have a laundry room, you need to have a shower. And ideally you want your showers to be close to the water heater because if the showers are far from the water heater, then you have to run the water for a while until it heats up. And that wastes all that. You're just flushing cold water down the drain. Right? You've done engineering drafting. Okay, so how do they how do they lay out the rooms in a house? Anyone know? This, this actually guides the design of most apartment buildings. Like the plumbing actually controls the design of most houses. Where is the bathroom? Where is the bathroom on the second floor? Your house, your house's master shower is literally as far away from the water heater as possible. Mine too. It takes a minute for the water to heat up. Or maybe even more. It's really annoying. Because I'm just watching all that water just like, you know, go down the drain. Literally. Um, when I replumbed my house last year, I thought about actually moving the water heater to over here because all the showers are on this side of the house. And if we just moved it over here, then the total amount of plumbing would actually be quite, quite small. Uh, we have a water heater tank. I've thought about getting an instant water heater as well, but okay. yeah, the least amount of actual pipes. That's, that's how houses are laid out. Like the reason, like if you think about it, like you could, you could do houses in any number of different ways, right? Like I got my office here. Like I could, I could feasibly have like a bathroom like right there, but there's not. And the reason for that is because all of the bathrooms in my house are all touching each other. They don't look like they're touching each other, but they do. So there's one in the master bedroom and in the corner of the master bedroom is the bathroom area. And then the office here has a bathroom this way. And that one is on the back side of the master bedrooms bathroom. And then upstairs doesn't look connected at all. Guess what? It's right above the other ones. And the reason for that is because then you don't have to run as much plumbing. You run plumbing to one column of bathrooms, right? There's the pipe comes up and then it goes both ways out of the drywall. Got one bathroom here, one bathroom here, goes up a floor and there's one there. And so the layout of this house is actually designed to minimize the, the amount of plumbing needed. Now there's still a branch that needs to go into the kitchen and there's one that goes into the laundry room slash um, water heater slash garage sink. Those are all clustered right next to each other too. And then the, the fridge and the kitchen are clustered next to each other. And then there's a hose bib on the outside, which is where you attach the hose. That's right on the back side of the, of the kitchen. So there's no, there, there's a hose bib in the front of the house where the water supply comes up. There's a hose bib on the back next to the kitchen because there's water there. There are no other hose bibs anywhere in the house. It's really weird. 
Like there, there probably should be at least a third one somewhere, but there's not. And the reason for that is because there's no plumbing anywhere else in the house. So when I replumb the house, they asked me, they're like, we can put in one back there, you know, basically on the backside of the, of the three bathrooms. Like we just drill out through the wall and put a hose bib there and you can have a hose on the side of your house as well. I said, now nah, it's all right. Eh. I got irrigation out there. If I need to water stuff, I can probably make it. Um, didn't do so good in that class. I thought engineering was computer science. That's funny. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. So basically the plumbing in a house is laid out according to the minimal spanning tree algorithm. Okay. The minimal spanning tree algorithm is this install plumbing in your house, paying the least possible for plumbing. Okay. Because plumbing is expensive. So architects will put bathrooms. Like if you're in an apartment complex, usually your bathroom is butted up against the bathroom of another apartment. And if you're on a multi-story apartment complex, your bathroom is above another bathroom, above another bathroom. And then on the back side of the wall, somebody else's apartment exists and they're flushed up against it too. And so apartments are going to be designed to minimize plumbing as well. So, um, you know, look, think about it. The next time you go into like somebody's house, like you'll, you'll see that all the bathrooms tend to be touching each other. All right. So how does a minimal spanning tree algorithm work? Okay. So there's two different ones. There's prims and there's crystals. The running times are actually a little bit different. Uh, crystals is edges times the log of the vertices and prims is edges plus the number of vertices times the log of the vertices. And so depending on your, how many edges you have versus how many vertices you have, sometimes one's faster, sometimes the other's faster, but basically it works like this. So just pick a, pick a spot at random, doesn't matter. And you add the shortest edge from the vertex. Does that sound like Dijkstra's to you? So we're starting on this. We just pick this one as our start node, doesn't actually matter. And then we, out of these two, we add the one that has the smallest uh, distance. It is. That's actually the, th the same thing as Dijkstra's. This algorithm is very similar to Dijkstra's. It's so similar, in fact, that a lot, of, a lot of students who think they're writing Dijkstra's write prims by accident. <laughs> the, most, the most common <laughs> mistake that people make when writing Dijkstra's is that they end up writing prims. And the only difference between Dijkstra's and prims is that when you're choosing a new node to add, in this case, we're going to add this one on prims. When you're choosing a new node to add to the process list, for Dijkstra's, it is total distance from start, right? So we got our start node here, and we've got uh, we've added this one in here, and then we've got all these possible people to add next, right? For Dijkstra's, we would do this one next. You guys with me on this? Do you see that? Like if we were doing if we were doing Dijkstra's algorithm, this one would be the next one because it's the distance of three. All of these people are all going to be a distance of four, six, five, right? Total. For prims, you don't do total distance from start. You just do edge distance, the new distance. That's it. That's literally the only difference. And you got Dijkstra's versus prims. So out of all the uh, edges we got here, rather than total distance from start, we just do distance. In other words, the next one we're going to pick is this one here because the distance is smaller than all the other ones and then we add that and repeat who's the next smallest uh, we got a three here let's add that one in who's next so we've got a three here we'll add that one in who's next uh these people have all been processed we got a four or a four either one of these will work i'll just pick this one like that and we're done that's a minimal spanning tree minimal spanning tree always adds to the process list the city or room or whatever the things represent, you always add the next vertex that has the smallest edge weight. That's it. So for Dijkstra's, the distance, 
the distance is equal to the distance of the person you're processing plus the edge weight. This is Dijkstra's. For prims, the distance that you're sorting on is just the distance of the edge. Oops, sorry. That's it. Same code. It's buggy Dijkstra's. Since the Dijkstra's is commonly used, when do you use prims and crystals? Well, uh, routing, for example. A lot of times you don't... Um, a lot of times... Well, okay, so for routing, you do shortest paths, right? Whenever you send a packet over the internet, the routers pick the 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 next router that'll minimize the total distance traveled. But let's say that you're going to be wiring a house for Ethernet, right? You use... You want to minimize the amount of Ethernet you install, right? You could probably do a faster, like if, if you're really worried about speed, you could probably run a cable direct or something, but uh, usually you don't. Um, the, the difference of 50 meters of uh, cabling versus 60 meters of cabling, the, the speed of light is going to ignore that. What's more important is the cost of installing extra cabling that you don't need. And so let's say that all of these are rooms in your house. And this is how many meters of cat, you know, whatever we're up to nowadays, category. What is the top one right now? Cat seven, cat six, cat eight. Uh, whatever the highest cat is right now. You know, the, the top tier can actually get quite expensive. So, uh, uh, I do have a Cat7 cable, I think, in here. I don't think it does anything. Um, the the router capped out at 1 gigabit a second, I think. So. Cat7. What is Cat7? Why you don't need it? Yeah. Uh, uh, let's see how expensive it is. 50 feet. 15 bucks? Okay. Not that expensive. Cat8. Look at that. 3 bucks. Eight bucks for ten feet, yeah, it's, it's something like that. Because I, 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 I have, I put my office here because this is where the internet comes out. So the water is over there. The uh, phone and cable is right on the back side of the wall, right here. And so I put my office here because I like being on Ethernet, not on Wi-Fi. And the uh, port speed on my computer is one gigabit a second. So um, Cat Seven allows for ten gigabits a second. It's not, it's not necessary. I just wanted to buy it so I could say that I have a Cat7 cable. Anyway, so let's say you're, you're wiring your house. This is the layout of your house. This is your kitchen, your bedroom, your office, whatever, your bathroom. You need to have Ethernet in your bathroom these days, you know. So uh, these two algorithms are used for graph design. Uh, well, it, it's, it's used for planning, you know, if you're... If you're designing the internet system, the internet system, the uh, interstate system, you know you want to minimize the cost of building the network, right? Dijkstra's is Dijkstra's is about minimizing speed, right? What's the fastest route you can take from here to San Diego? That's Dijkstra's. For Prims, it's like how do I hook up the cities in California when I'm building the roads to minimize the total cost? That's a minimal spanning tree. A minimal spanning tree is a tree that connects all the nodes at minimal cost. San Francisco's road network, of course, used a maximal spanning tree. <laughs> and they use anti-dykstras for all of their routing purposes. Be nice if we had teleportation. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Um, does that make sense? So you got you got your house here. This is how many meters apart they are, and you want to hook up all the rooms in your house on Ethernet while minimizing the total amount of cabling you have to install. So that's one possibility. Note that I came up with a different one, but that's okay because four and a four is a tie, right? So. You, you don't, like if there's a tie, you just pick one at random. It's 
fine. It's not a big deal. Fat power teleportation. So if you ever get fat, you just teleport a couple extra times. There you go. <clears throat> For dextras, you can't do negatives. Uh, what is an algorithm similar but can be used to take care of negative values? Well, if you think about fastest routes, like it doesn't make sense for there to be a negative time cost on a route, you know? Like, what does that even mean? What does it mean for there to be a negative distance between two cities? Traveling backwards in time? Like, you know, uh, there, there was a bug, by the way, caused by that, where a uh, person entered a bad route and broke the internet. So if you put in a... Back then, uh, people didn't vet their inputs. Like, a, what I constantly harp on, you know, what I constantly... What I constantly harp on in this class in 40 and 41 is always vet your inputs. Don't trust anybody, not even yourself. Yeah, somebody put in a negative number and broke the internet because then it became optimal for every packet on the internet to route itself through this thing, this one little route, infinite times, right? Every time you go through the route, you move backwards in time. So the, the way the algorithm works is it'll just go through that infinite times and it takes negative infinite. And um, yeah, never trust yourself, never trust your users, never trust anybody on the internet, especially. Um, yeah, so yeah, just reject it, you know, like it, nowadays, I mean, it's obviously fixed, but it's like, like, I'm just sort of like professionally offended that like there's professional software that doesn't check for negative numbers and things like that. And, and, and like, like I said, when, when you, some of you had me for 40, one of my favorite things to do is whenever there's a web website, that's like, please donate money to us. The first thing I do is I just type, I, I want to donate negative $500. I just want to see if they, I, I just want to see if they handle it. You know what I mean? Like I'm not trying to scam money out of people. I just want to see, does their code have an, if money less than zero, you know, and some of them do mostly because to avoid, uh, transaction penalties, because there's a cost to running a credit card. So they don't allow you to donate less than like five bucks. And that catches it because negative 500 is less than five, but a lot of them don't. And a lot of them will get to the point where it's like, all right, enter your credit card number. We're going to, we're going to bill you negative money. And it, and it just it hurts me deep inside that like, you're making something exposed to the internet that doesn't have an if statement. The most big, like the first thing I think of, like I'm reading input from the, from somebody on the internet. First of all, I'm going to get rid of everything that's not a number, you know, like everything that's not a number go, goes away. Uh, maybe I'll keep a decimal. That's it. You know, and that would actually handle the problem because the minus sign is, you know, but like, uh, you know, I would then check to see if the money is between $5 and whatever the maximum is, because I don't want to, I don't want to have overflow either. So don't allow donations bigger than, I don't know, a million or something. You know? Like if they're going to donate a million, it's probably not going to be, you know, on some random website, you know, they're probably going to call me up, you know? So, <clears throat> and so many, so many websites just don't, you know? I want to donate $4.3 billion. Overflow. Right. So uh, it just, it just annoys me. Okay. Anyway. So yeah, uh, negative, negative distances for, um, Dexter's doesn't make sense for prims. I think it would work. You just sort them, uh, smallest to greatest. And if you have a negative weight on there, um, then it will just pick that one first. So prims and crystals, are stable with negative numbers, but again, it, it's unclear what it means. Like, what does it mean that it is negative 10 meters of cabling? If you install there, the company will give you 10 meters for free. Maybe, I don't know. I guess that makes sense. So, um, yeah, so prims and crystals. Okay. So let's talk about crystals. So crystals is the same. It's, these are both MSTs. These are both minimal spanning tree implementations. I was just thinking about it in a way if we deal with bad values. Yeah. So with Dijkstra's, you just say, no, this is a bad graph. I can't, I can't solve this. Simple. 
So crystals is the same as prims, except with one small difference. Rather than having a start node, rather than having a start node and growing the graph out from there, rather than having a start node, you just always pick the edge with the smallest distance that isn't connecting to process nodes. So for crystals, you start off by picking the edge that has the smallest distance, and then you pick the edge of the smallest distance. In this case, it's the same. Okay. And then we're gonna pick, I don't know, a three, and look at this. These are, this is a forest now. It's a forest of trees, which means you have multiple trees. So crystals will actually grow multiple trees and then uh, potentially merge them together over time. And you'll end up with the same graph as before, as prims, with one important exception. Uh, by the way, don't pay any attention to the fact that these are superficially different, because the you see how it's a three and a three and a four and a four. Yeah, it's just if you get a, if you get a tie, flip a coin, right? Like it, it, it doesn't matter. But can anyone think of a, a scenario in which Crystal's algorithm will work and Prim's won't work? So the Crystal's approach grows trees in different places around the country. Like let's say you're, uh, let's say you're doing the interstate system, and so you're going to start by adding the cities that are the closest in America, like Minneapolis, St. Paul, and then you're going to do um, Miami and I don't know whatever South South Beach, Miami, South Miami. What is it? It's a different city, right? South Miami. Yeah, South Miami is separate it's a separate city in Miami so um, yeah you start off by adding all the closest ones together can you guys think of a, of a place where the interstate system wouldn't work the, the design of the, the interstate system wouldn't work if uh, you were using Prim's algorithm Hawaii, exactly. Hawaii's got an interstate on it, even though it doesn't connect to different si even though it doesn't connect to a different state yet. I guess I don't know. You can always build a tunnel. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, Hawaii would not work with Prim's algorithm. Either you would start on Hawaii, and it would grow the network to all the cities on the island in Hawaii that you start on, and ignore America, or you start in the continental U.S. more likely, and then Hawaii just gets neglected. So for disconnected graphs, like McCohen said, prims doesn't work, but crystals uh, will work because it'll, it'll over and over again, pull the smallest edges and add them to your process list. And so it'll work with Hawaii and Alaska and stuff like that. So. Usually though, the only difference between the two is the, the running time that we care about. So if you have a lot of vertices and very few edges, then crystals is better. If you have very few edges and a lot of vertices, then E, if E is, you know, so if you have a lot of, yeah. So just, you just plug the numbers in basically and just kind of work it out. Norway's $47 billion coastal highway. That's pretty cool. Pretty cool. Okay, so yeah, in general, they give you the, the same thing. So, do you guys understand minimal spanning tree? Um, the goal of minimal spanning tree is to hook together all the vertices in the graph using as few edges, uh, few total weight of the edges as possible. So, yeah, a lot of design problems do MST. Uh, Coding wise, it's one line of code different from Dijkstra's. So, yeah. Pretty, once you can do Dijkstra's, you can do Prim's pretty easily. Crystal's is a little bit different because um, you have to, you don't just have a, you have to have like, um, mm. I mean, as long as you don't need the intermediate representation, it should be fine. But, 
Uh, you just have to check to see if both of them are processed when you add it. With prims, you've got your list of people that have been processed and the people that are not processed. With crystals, every time you go to add an edge, you have to check to see if both are already in it. You know, and if they are, you can still hook them up. Right, so it, it's, right, because like this has been processed and that's been processed. But because they're in disconnected graphs, then you still hook them up. So it's, it's, a, little bit, uh, it's a little bit trickier to do crystals than prims. Um, usually you do like some sort of set merge kind of kind of thing. So yeah, you, you build a, you have a data structure of different sets. So this, this would be one set, this would be one set. And then if you're going to connect them, you check to see if they're both in the same set. If they are, you like, if, if we were trying to dr uh, add these two together, they're both in the same set. So we don't add them, but if you're trying to add these two, they're in different sets. So we add the connection between them. So it's a, it's a little bit trickier to do cross schools, but not it's not too terrible either. Okay, uh, switch user. How'd that, how'd that window come up? Okay, so let's do um, let's do Prim's algorithm. We'll start at zero. So here's our starting node. So which node should I add to my mental spanning tree? One or four. These are the two possibilities. One is two meters away, four is three meters away. Which one do I add? All right, good, Mr. Singh. All right, so we'll add one to our mineral spanning tree. Now, out of all the different edges we have, we got a three, a two, a two, a three. Which one is the smallest? Two. And we've got two twos, so we'll pick pick a number at random. Do you want to add five or do you want to add four? Five. Okay, cool. So we'll add five. Now, out of all the edges that we have coming out of us, we got a three, a two, a three, and a one. Which one of those is the smallest? The one. So we're gonna add six. Okay. So now out of all, of all the edges we got coming out, we got a three, we got a two. Got a three, got a two, got a two, we got a three. Uh, which one's the smallest? Two. And pick one at random, two, three, or four. It doesn't matter to me. It's all the same. Three, okay. So I'll add three in here. And then we've got another two, so pick randomly between this. So seven and two and four. Pick a number, seven, two, or four. Two hook you up and then it actually doesn't matter at this point we're gonna hook up both of these so there we go so that is the minimal spanning tree using prims now let's do the same thing with crystals so with crystals what we do is we look at the total graph and always add the edges that have the smallest total weight so we start off with this one here and then pick any of these twos. I guess I'll pick this one at random here. And then out of any of these twos, I'll pick this one at random here. And then, I don't know, this one here. So you can see right now we've actually got three different trees going on, right? This one here, I'm just picking things at random. So I've got zero, one, and four. So this is one tree here. This is one tree here. And if these guys never get connected, that's fine too. Like it'll, it'll you know, you can, you can solve the minimal spanning tree on Hawaii at the same time you do it for the rest of the country, that's fine. But these are connected, so eventually we're gonna pick the two, and we're gonna pick the two, and there we go. So, it gets the same result as prims on the connected graph. So, um, oh yeah, solving a maze is also dextrose. So that's, a, that's an assignment I've done. All right, so that's it for today. It's past noon already. Um, any questions about the homework? An old spanning tree? Yeah, once the edges have been processed, um, then they, they, they don't get messed with again. But in general, with prims, you can just keep track of which nodes have been processed, and you just ignore any edges coming into a process node. 
Um, with crystals, you have to kind of track the different uh, Prim's Carmel General Store. Hmm. How about Prim's algorithm? Google. So it adds the one first, then it adds the two, then it adds the three. Uh, generation of a maze using Prim's algorithm. Let's see here. Hmm, that's cool. So I think they probably populated this with just random numbers, and then it's minimally spanning all the, um, so like all the tile connections would just have a random number associated with it. And then it's going to do a minimal spanning tree, which is going to, uh, there's probably, it probably alternates wall and something. Um, and value, and then it'll span all the different cell sites on it, and you can make a you can make a maze out of it. It's kind of cool. A very similar algorithm, yeah. <laughs> you gonna do one more example. Uh, let's do crystals this time, I guess. So uh, you guys just tell me which which edges to add. So out of this graph here, which edge is the smallest? Who's got the smallest edge weight? One. Okay. So. Uh, So, step one is complete. Now, out of the remaining edges, which one is smallest? Six. Uh, there's a four, there's a... Oh, do you mean B6? Yeah, we've got, we've got two twos, right? We can, we can either add this one or we can add this one. Because for prims, you, you have, for prims, you would have a starting node, right? that you grow out of, and you're always adding the smallest edge connected to your your tree as you grow it. With crystals, though, which is what we're doing right now, uh, you just pick the smallest edge weight anywhere on the map that does not connect two cities that are already in the same set. Yeah. Okay, what's next? Which, uh, which vertices should I add next? Which vertices? Seven and six. Good. Okay. What's next? Vargas, are you here? Pata, Vargas, Jahab. Frente, Cheryl. You guys are just letting uh, Singh and Yoxlimer talk. Which is fine. Good job, Singh and Uh Three and six. Sure, why not? So that'll merge our trees together. Okay. Cheryl, uh, which one should we do next? Sarah, which one should we do next? Zero and one, very good. That, we're doing crystals, right? So we just look at the entire graph and pick off the edge that has the smallest um, smallest weight that does not connect two people that are in the same set. 
it's crystals. All right, uh, is Vargas here? No. Alex, you here? Okay, Vargas, which edge should I add next? We're doing Kruskal's algorithm, six. Uh, so we can't add, this one is no, no bueno, because this would be connecting two nodes that are in the same set already. See that? We are making something called a DAG, a directed acyclic, actually it's not a DAG, it's just an acyclic graph we're making here. And so there cannot be any cycles. This would create a cycle here, not allowed. Okay. For prims, I think it's arguably a DAG. Uh, for this one, it's not exactly directed, so it doesn't matter. Uh, four and five, four and five, can we add four and five? Here's four and five, that's a nine. No, we can't do that one yet because there's smaller edges. Uh, Connor has three and four, yes, I think that's the right one. So you're always looking for the smallest edge weight that connects two nodes that are not in the same set. That's the rule for crystals. Zero and eight for Cheryl, that's an eight. Yeah, that's fine for the next one, sure. We do that one here. And that's going to merge these two different sets together here. Uh, what's next? I think everybody's in the same set now except for five. So yeah, four and five this way. And there you go. So that is our minimal spanning tree. That's hooking up all of the nodes on the graph using the minimal total amount of weights. Okay. That's minimal spanning tree. And all of these all of these algorithms are just like part of the common understanding of computer science people. Like I said, CSI 26 is often used in job interviews. No loops, yeah. Yeah. No loops. You're making a DAG or for crystals is not directed, but whatever. Um, no loops. Acyclic. It must be acyclic. Okay. You gotta add people to the network that are not both in the network. So, uh, if you go into a job interview and somebody gives you a question, uh, a lot of times you can not have to answer the question by just saying, oh, I'd use, I'd use crystals for that. You know, uh, we want you to figure out a way of laying out, um, circuit components or something on a printed circuit board that will minimize the amount of, uh, total uh, you know, circuit distance, you know, the amount of copper you got to put down. We're trying to minimize the amount of copper in the, in the thing. Oh, well, I'll just use crystals for that. Okay. Next question. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it, there, a, a lot of job interview questions are actually just trying to see if you paid attention in this class, 41 and 26 in particular, 45, um, you'll get architecture questions. Like trying to see if you have some intuition about how hardware works. Um, usually not very detailed for computer science people, but for algorithms, like algorithms are really important to computer science people. Cause if you do it wrong, your code lasts until the, um, 45 is so confusing. Are you, are you in 45 right now? Um, you can write an algorithm that either runs until the heat death of the universe which uh, for your Dijkstra's assignment is quite possible, or you can have it finish like that. And the difference is the algorithms. And the difference is also not writing code with bugs in it. There's that too. If you have an infinite loop in your in your implementation, like if you don't check to see if something's been processed yet, or you forget to add it to the process node, then you'll fall into an infinite loop and it'll run forever. So, um, Job interviews, though, very commonly ask you questions from 41 and 26. And a lot of times you just kind of wave your hands and be like, oh, I would use Dijkstra's algorithm for that. I would use Prim's algorithm for that. I'd use Kruskal's algorithm for that. And that's demonstrating to the uh, interviewer that you know what you're talking about. And if they say, okay, go on, then you'll have to be able to, 
you know, at least whiteboard out a crystal solution. You know what I mean? So, um, sometimes though you can just get away with like, oh yeah, I know, I know how, how, how would solve that. And that's good because they, they want to make sure that when they're hiring somebody, sometimes they'll ask you to code it. A lot of times no, because like if I know that somebody knows what algorithm to use, like I'm confident they'll be able to do it well. You know what I mean? Whereas if they start thinking about it, like, huh, how would I solve shortest paths? Then that means they've never encountered that problem before. And they're probably going to come up with some, you know, hackish solution that is going to be exponential or, or not even work, you know? And so what, when you're hiring somebody, you don't want to hire somebody that's going to waste your money. You want to hire somebody that will be able to get jobs done quickly. And, you know, I, I wouldn't expect somebody to be able to actually code, you know, Dijkstra's in real time. I mean, maybe, but I mean, how long is the interview? You know what I mean? Like, it, se it seems like kind of a waste to, like if somebody, like if they can at least at a high level do this, you know, if they can, if they get sketched out on the screen and just sketch out their solution and I'm confident they can at least program their way out of a wet paper bag, like I, I'd, I'd be fine with it, you know? I'd want to see them write some code, you know, just to make sure they could. But for high level questions like algorithms and things like that, like it's just mostly like have they encountered it before and they know the answer. How would you do this? Uh, I'd use A star. It's a form of dextrose, you know. And uh, that's, you know, you, you can look at books of programming uh, questions and things like that. I think I might have some on here. GDC. Uh. <laughs> Why do you do this? Yeah. Yeah. Making people code on a whiteboard is actually, um, it's kind of brutal. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, surprise, not about your code. Um, they're looking for a reason to not hire you. They're not, you're not going to give them to you. So, um, This is uh, what they, they want people not to do, right? So, uh, <laughs> so what, what, what you're doing in a, in a whiteboard program is you're just trying to see how you think and how you operate, right? And uh, yeah, so when, when you're doing a whiteboard interview, ask them good questions, trying to figure out, okay, can, the, can these values be negative? Um, what, you know, roughly how many vertices are we talking about? Um, you know, try to get a good sense of the requirements when you're coding, you ask them questions, you talk to them. Um, there you go. So there's, there's the role for whiteboard interviews and stuff like that. So I can, um, it's good advice. Good advice. Ask, talk, use comments. Pseudocode it out first. Uh, calmly fix any mistakes you make. Test. Do a walkthrough of it. Test. Test. The whiteboard eats 50 points of your IQ. <laughs> it's funny. What is the value of A? <laughs> So the, the point here, like you guys should all be able to get the answer, right? What's the value of A after this? Good runs. 10, yeah. Uh, the point is that, like when you're under a stressful situation, you'd be like, ah. So, you, you know, basically my attitude on, on job interviews is always just to be very, ca like very casual. It's like, I didn't care that much, right? So, um, Fizzbuzz. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah, so there, there's all sorts of good, you know, things. 
on job interviews. Uh, but yeah, uh, and, and, and again, a lot of the questions, um, that one was on how to do a whiteboard interview, but a lot of the questions that they've compiled from different companies are, you know, graph theory is very popular. Data structures are very popular. So just make sure you know those. Okay. So that is it for today, guys. Uh, work on your homework summit, and we'll come back on Tuesday and take a look. So don't expect any help Friday to Sunday, because I'm going to be gone. So work on it tonight, or last chance on Monday. I might go to bed early on Monday. So, you know, no guarantee of help late at night on Monday either. Okay. <laughs> All right, see you guys.